Hello, welcome back to the show, everyone. Today I have on Nathan from Absurd Being. Um, you might have seen his channel. He does an extensive amount of uh, deep diving into some pretty important philosophical texts that we're going to talk about coming up here. Uh, Nathan, I'm going to let you introduce yourself a little bit just because I didn't prepare a whole lot of uh, preparatory notes for this one. So, yeah, let okay, the yeah. audience know who you are, I guess. And yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thanks, Jared. It's good to be here. Um, so my name's Nathan. I have, uh, in terms of philosophical background, I I did like a, um, it's called a graduate diploma. Once I did my, my degree, um, I found out, I discovered philosophy at that point and was like, hey, this is awesome. Uh, and so I thought I'd follow it up and a graduate diploma just kind of bridges the gap between um, a degree and maybe moving into a master's in a different field. Uh, so I did that's a year and then I did that for a year and then I was uh, it wasn't really my wasn't really what I was into at that time. Um, so I ended up doing a bit of a, um, a detour teaching English that became the next kind of focus for me and that brought me to Korea here. Uh, so I'm originally from New Zealand. Uh, and then into into Korea, um, where I spent a few years teaching kids English. Philosophy was long gone by then, and um, and then I, I I managed to work my way into a university here teaching English still, and then philosophy kind of came back for me and um, in kind of a serious way, and then yeah and and just to kind of further my own understanding, I found that I was making extensive notes on these um, texts that I was reading just to try and understand them. And then, and then I, I always, I've always had in the back of my mind this idea that uh, the best way to, to know something is to teach it. But given my mm -hmm. situation, it wasn't really feasible to teach philosophy. Uh, so YouTube was kind of an option. And um, yeah, I started making a video series on Sartre's being in nothingness and uh, and pretty much I blink my eyes and now here we are, like 200 and something videos later. And uh, yeah, it's kind of, that's what I've been doing the last eight years or so. Yeah. So I got your, I wanted to throw your website up here so that uh, people could see that you also have, you know, extensive notes and a little bit of blogging that you did in the past. Yeah. Uh, along with your, the YouTube, which uh, put that on here too, where you have all of these videos going over Sartre, as you said, Heidegger, Nietzsche, Kierkegaard, you know, a lot of the stuff that I focus on heavily in uh, uh, what I research. But, you know, unlike you, I have the really bad habit of relying on secondary sources right. and um, focusing on on the the source materials just I, especially with this stuff i find it very challenging um yeah me too me too yeah uh so i mean i wanted to definitely applaud your work on this i've watched a lot of it just trying to understand some of these concepts myself and i know right now you're working on deleuze but i thought you know maybe we should kind of start from the beginning your focus seems to mostly be phenomenology if not even more specifically existentialism but you yeah. did you did get into Husserl and I was hoping maybe you could just uh, help us understand what when we talk about phenomenology what are we talking about yeah, so uh, so yeah, the, the phenomenologists it starts with Husserl and then it, it kind of segues into Heidegger, um, but then he moves in a slightly different direction from Husserl. So there was tension between those two, and then uh, kind of into ontology, being with Heidegger, and then then at Sartre and Malo Ponty, Levinas, those guys come along the, the French side. Of phenomenology follows on, follows on from that, but when I when I say phenomenology, um, I mean like the structures of conscious experience. 
So a description of how we experience um, the world, how we experience anything. And the, the biggest misconception I think around this is that phenomenology is just a description of experience. So if you experience something, that's your phenomenology of that or whatever, which really ends up as just like a relativist kind of position. It doesn't really tell us anything interesting philosophically. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's, so it's a description of those essential invariant structures that make up conscious experience, things that are, would, would apply to anybody, any human being experiencing anything. And that's so, basically phenomenology is for me. Um, yeah. And so I think, you know, one of the important things to lay out is like, how do you get from the description of experience that you might, you know, call relativistic or just like somewhat, you know, if someone's writing like a, a journal entry, they're going to be describing their experiences or whatever. How do you yeah. get from that to what Husserl was doing with the reductions and and this and that? Yeah, well, I mean that's the th that's the point. You're trying to step back, step out of those um, kind of um, subjective experiences, and and that was the point of of the reduction too, to to kind of um, move move away from bracket out those kinds of or well, actually to so the bracketing the, the reduction was was more to get rid of um, empiricism the empirical way of thinking about reality and uh, the kind of the scientific third person perspective and so once you once you kind of get rid of that then you have this clearer picture of what's happening in the mind say the the actual conscious experience and then, yeah, you d you're just looking for what it is that makes each um, experience an experience of that thing. So, for example, with something like um, a perception, if you have a perception, we can, we can perceive different things. So someone might perceive a ghost. Do they have a phenomenology, a phenomenological experience of a ghost? No, that, that's just what they think they saw. <clears throat> but the phenomenology will come about because in perception, that when they perceive the ghost, they'll see it in space, for example. So with a spatial kind of reference, they'll see it in time. There'll be a temporal aspect to it. And those things will be the same no matter what it is you're experiencing. What, uh, sorry, no matter what it is you're perceiving. So they're, they're, they're the invariant essences of your perception. It doesn't matter what you're perceiving. You'll always be perceiving something in space and time. And that that gives you the phenomenology that you're looking for to describe perception. And we can do this with memory, with belief, with expectation. They all have this invariant structure which which follows along with them, which comes along with them. Right. And I know one of the things who Cyril was really adamant about was you know, insisting that this is not just psychology and right. that yeah. this is something more basic. And in fact, even like can be the groundwork needed for any scientific endeavor afterwards. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. What can you explain what some of his arguments were about about that? I know that we're going to kind of get all over the place after Husserl. So <laughs> I kind of feel like if we nail nail some of his stuff down a bit, we could have a solid base to go off of. Yeah. Uh, with, with, with regards to science, psychology. Yeah. His arguments against psychologism and what it is about the scientific worldview that needs to be bracketed out right. to, to begin with. Yeah. I mean, because that, that essentially it's, it's, um, That, that it's like that materialist or empiricist way of thinking about the world. It's it's not uncovering, uh, it's not getting to the core of an experience. So it's already it's already been um, filtered through these invariant structures of conscious experience, and so it, it's like it's just it's it's arriving at the party a little late to understand what it is that's actually going on. 
it's already when we see an object and, and describe it as say um, made up of atoms or uh, we we talk about the, I don't, the when you get into psychology the desires or the you know whatever whatever framework you're using that's already been filtered through this absolute originary um, lens which is conscious experience which is your experience so when psychology talks about memory for example or, or trauma repressed memories there's al already an assumption here of what a memory is and that what a memory is hasn't been investigated and that's what Husserl's trying to do get to that core what what is what is it that makes a memory a memory before we can talk about whether there's any repression or trauma or how this is affecting, you know, you and your life, um, we have to we have to uncover first what is this thing called a memory? What is it that makes a memory a memory or a perception a perception? Yeah. So, yeah, I you know when I tell people about this, I feel like their eyes kind of glaze over like, what do, what do I care about that? This right, right. So yeah. like, so elementary, but it's interesting that, you know, you don't actually get a ton of this kind of uh, investigation in the history of philosophy until you get to Husserl, you get, uh, especially in the time period he's, he's writing in. Yeah. So Yeah. Yeah. That's right. And I mean, I found it with, well, so much with Husserl, but I found it with Heidegger. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of stuff that's, it's, uh, I just feel like page after page, he's just peeling back these layers and showing what it is to be a human being, how it is we actually experience. And uh, the descriptions that he gives, um, there was just so much in there. And I, I, I say this, in various places, but it just resonates with you. When I when I read something in Heidegger, I'm like, that's exactly what it's like actually to live, to to see something. That is how I relate to these objects around me. Um, and yeah, you, you don't get that in other places. And even in Husserl, I found Husserl was very dry, very abstract. It's not really. Yeah, I, I never had that experience with Husserl. Like. Yeah, this is this is you know he's nailed my experience here, but I had that in every all through being in time, being in nothingness, Merleau Ponty, phenomenology of perception. Those guys just really honed in um, on what Husserl was saying, and, and and they just expanded and went 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 ran away with it from there. Yeah. So in the you know I wanted to ask you, is there like how do you choose who you're going to focus on? For your episodes because it's not chronological um, right yeah um yeah how do i it's it's really just who i'm interested in it's who i want to understand um and that was kind of it, 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 it's, it's a selfish channel let's be honest it's a selfish youtube channel i just do what i i do what i want basically and sure. um I'm not like catering to any anybody or and I don't really do requests I can't a couple of people have asked me to do certain works but the effort involved is just is too much to um to kind of take requests like that so I just do what I want it's like who I'm interested in so if I if I do a video series it means that I'm uh, I'm interested in that philosopher so I think for me the place I like to begin when thinking about this whole approach to philosophy is actually Merleau-Ponty. Mm. And uh, I just think a lot of the, you know, where philosophy went after the 1970s, I guess we'll say, with like the linguistic turn in French theory and all this, uh, you know, a lot of these concepts are kind of established within Merleau Ponty's writing as far as yeah. embodiment and uh, perception and things like that. So I know you got Heidegger, you got Nietzsche and e Emmanuel Levinas and even Japanese philosophy. But yeah. for me, I think, you know, Merleau Ponty's someone special. So I wanted to hear you mm. like 
talk about him a little bit, maybe like what what was he getting at that Husserl wasn't? And I, I don't know how to do this without talking about these other people. What did he what was his issues with like Heidegger and Sartre and people like that? Yeah. Um, yeah, you can't talk about them kind of on their own, right? They, they do come in, in a context. And, uh, well, Merleau-Ponty always tried to stick close. And in his writings, he always maintained he was just a building on his soil. Like he, he never really criticizes him he t- and he takes up some of the terminology, Husserl's terminology. One thing actually that was interesting was in Phenomenology of Perception, he um, he's the only one of the three, Heidegger, Sartre, and Merleau-Ponty, he's the only, or he's the only one out of those three who um, explicitly says he's, he's keeping the reduction, he's keeping Husserl's reduction. The other two just disavow it straight away. Heidegger does it right at the beginning of being in time. Says we've got to go the opposite direction. We don't want to bracket out the world. We want to get into it. And um, yeah. yeah, and but then even when Milo Ponti says he, he's he's bracketing, he wants to keep the bracket, the reduction. He um, and I just bring I mix those two together. That maybe there is a technical difference, but broadly they're the same. The reduction and the um, bracketing. Well, Maybe we'll come back to him because Sartre, I feel like I'm more familiar with Sartre than anybody else. So okay. uh, it'll be a little easier for me to talk about him. But I know his his whole thing about Husserl was this thing with the ego and uh, whether or not it was transcendental, right? Right, yeah. That was and one of his issues, eh? I think, I don't know if, like, I've read somewhere that this was kind of like, uh, a reading of early Husserl that if you get to the later stuff, it's not quite as uh, apt of a critique of what Husserl thought. But I feel like this is sort of something that's maintained also in Heidegger and in um, Merleau-Ponty is this is what's going on with the ego and what the problem is uh, positing that the ego is kind of something like within consciousness. And so, yeah, what it like, just your kind of, I guess, global take on this. What did, what have you come out of this thinking about the ego? Yeah, that was the one, because Husserl calls it transcendental. He calls it in his philosophy, uh, phenomenology, he calls transcendental phenomenology. And that's, and it is this, this idea that, um, yeah, the ego is some, some, there's this, kind of transcendental ego outside of um, the world, essentially, that, that is constituting the world. And that's kind of where Husserl takes his phenomenology. He ends up with what um, I think Merleau-Ponty calls it a constituting ego. So it's, and it's, it's literally the world is being created for and out of this transcendental ego that that is therefore not a full part of the world. And um, and Sartre's pretty critical of that. Heidegger as well, that's why he wants to get into the world instead of bracket it. And uh, Milo Ponti, and especially in the, the Visible and the Invisible, which is the book that Milo Ponti was writing, never finished. He was writing it when he died. And he, um, yeah, in there he talks about this, this problem with, thinking that there's there's an ego detached from everything else that is constituting constituting its reality, constituting the world. And the, the problem is there's an element of truth to that too, right? Because it's not, we're not like, um, their, their consciousness, if we can use that word for now, brings something to the party. But we want to try and kind of include it within the world. We don't want to detach it from reality as, as like a, an observer or a spectator. And you get a sense of that with the way Husserl was was writing as well when he did um, Cartesian meditations, which is obviously that's Descartes' opinion, that the, the split dualism, mind and matter or mind and body. And um, and yeah, that that's kind of the, the main, I think, you, like you said, that that's the main obstacle to kind of picking up and Husserl and just running with them. 
this bright this break into a transcendental realm where the ego is constituting everything um and so the other guys you mentioned they all try and put us back into the world put us back into the middle of things and we get it and and i think that's why when you're reading heidegger Merleau ponty sart you you feel like yes that's that's exactly how i feel when i when i see an apple that's right. they've nailed that experience whereas with it you don't get that with a seal because he's he's trying to step back from that get out of that experience so he can describe it and uh, and you get this yeah this kind of dis- disconnect a little bit yeah and i mean you know with who Searle, he like has this you know he'll talk about numbers and like numerous mm. and just, mm. it's just like it's really abstract stuff yeah i mean it's really hard to read yeah um as far as like Merleau Ponty goes, you know, I think, you know, he begins phenomenology of perception describing sense perception. And, you know, at the time and probably still today, right, there's this way of understanding sensation as uh, a relationship between like, I don't know, the brain and sense data or something like that. Right. Yes. And this is sort of his launching off point for how, you know, he gets to emphasizing meaning uh, in, um, in the way that perception works. So, and this is why I think it's so, such a contemporary philosophy, even though it's like 70 years old or something like that at this point. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So can you talk a little bit about what, you know, we talked about the ego thing, but what is, what's going on with perception and sensation and the body and this and that, that we get in Merleau-Ponty? Yeah. And that, for me, that's the big thing that Merleau-Ponty brings to this, which is the body. He really emphasizes the role of the body, the way we are embodied and, and all of our experiences kind of hinge on or, or centered around this body, which is not just, a tool that we, we tend to think of the body as the tool that the mind is using, you know, and that's the way we, we kind of bridge the gap between the mind and the world. But already there you've, you've created a dualistic split. The mind is over here. The, the, the world's over here. We've got to connect the two and the body f- features in that role. But for Merleau-Ponty, and this is um, also kind of the problem we had with Sartre was Sartre's got the for itself and the in itself, which is not really the same thing as as the mind matter split. I always feel like Sartre gets a raw deal when he gets compared to Descartes with that. Oh well, it's yeah. just Cartesianism with words changed. It's not. He's doing ontology, I think, with it's like it's a it's a being for itself, being in itself. He's got something different in mind, but um, but yeah, Milo Ponti just wants to go beyond even that. And he talks about this a lot in The Visible and the Invisible again. I keep going back to that because that's what I'm doing at the moment. That's the, the video series I'm working on at the moment. Okay. Um, so it's kind of fresh in my mind. And um, But, yeah, he keeps coming back to this idea that Sartre has this, this, this dichotomy. Maybe it's not a metaphysical one with mind and matter, but and Merlo, Merlo, what Merlo Ponty wants to do is, is – bring these together and 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 through the phenomenology of perception as well yeah he he describes tries to describe the way that we um as you said our when we sense it's not it, there isn't um this external world of of data we're receiving which we are then compiling or arranging or organizing in some way and getting something meaningful at the end of it it's it's a the connection is much more entangled than that and um i forget the word he uses to describe um this but like a a, a communion he calls it a lived communion in phenomenology of perception this when we sense the world it's not it's not kind of a spectator receiving data and then doing something with it it's it's a communion it's a genuine intermeshing of of two things which aren't two things there's only one thing here but when we when we try and understand it we break it up into two 
and we can we can get a nice picture and we can get some useful insights, which I think is what Sartre did with being for itself and being in itself. We got some good philosophy, um, but but that's still an abstract position because the the whole together is different from the two parts separated and then brought together. So I feel like Milo Ponte is trying to think that whole before the separation. So with Merlo, so the one you're working on right now, visible and invisible, is that yeah. the one where he introduces this concept of the flesh of the world? Yeah, yeah, that, that's right. Okay. And that's sort of, I think, isn't that serve the same function as what you're saying about the communion? It's exactly. sort of that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And he talks about another thing which is quite useful when you're thinking about this is the, um, and he does this in phenomenology of perception. I think he mentions it. But the left hand and the right hand, if you uh, if you touch one, you know, the left hand is touching, the right hand is touched. But there is this re reciprocity there. You can switch between the two and the right hand can be the, the kind of active and the left is the passive recipient. And, and that holds a real, um, it's kind of an interesting point for Milo Ponte that at first, when I first read it, I was like, okay, what? he seems to be getting too much out of this, the more <laughs> out of this than there's really, really there. But, but yeah, as I was thinking about it, it's, it's really, he's going to that, that idea of um, in order to have say a, an experience, we have to both be able to touch and to be touched. So there has to be that pa passivity and that um, activity um, both have to be combined, and that's what a human being is. It's not, it isn't like a for itself interacting within itself or a mind interacting with the world. It's it's fully in the world as something which can, as something passive, as something which can be touched or be felt as well as feeling or touching. And, yeah, it's it's really difficult to describe to describe, which I, you know I imagine why that's such a thick book. Um, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things I think is really interesting about him too, is he gets into the, like the German gestalt, uh, psychology literature, you know, where you have the foreground and the background and yeah, you know, yeah. these are some of like the foundational studies in perception psychology that you still learn about today. If you take a, you know, a psychology class, mm. uh, which is, this is actually how I got into any of this stuff is through the uh, through the route of psychology oh, so right. uh which is funny you know basically i was not satisfied with psychology and its methods and wanted to go deeper which is okay. what got me into yeah. but but anyway um so so with uh with phenomenology of perception right you get this amazing uh introduction of the body and, and of the uh the you know, the communion of the body with the world and all this stuff. And I feel like, you know, between that Sartre, at least during that kind of time period and Heidegger, you know, the difficult thing seemed to be getting to ethics. <laughs> How do you get from, uh, from these elaborate descriptions of, the structure of consciousness or the the difference between perception and ideate you know ideas and concepts and all this stuff how do you get to ethics and i know you covered levinas yeah who is kind of like i've kind of actually put him off to the side uh just because he seems very difficult to understand right but I do know he's. They're the all difficult. <laughs> yes, they. Yeah. That's yes, they're incredibly difficult. Um, <laughs> but he, I do think of him as the ethics guy, and like, you know, I know this was a big hangup. Sartre never really completed his work on ethics. He yeah. he really tried hard, <laughs> but uh, and then Heidegger, there was you know, notebooks for an ethics, wasn't there? Notebook. For yeah, ethics. yeah. It remained unpublished. I think. I don't even know if it was published in his lifetime, but right. um, we have it now, and it was right. incomplete. Okay, I haven't I haven't read it, 
I haven't. How 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 long is it? As long as it's a hill, grab it real quick. <laughs> okay. So it's Jeez, okay. So right. More than and a notebook. Is, so more and, than I was expecting. And it really is like, you know, unstructured okay. in the way that you would expect from from someone's notebook. So right, right. Yeah, it's a mammoth work. It, I mean, the last thing he wrote, or like major thing he was working on, uh his The Family Idiot. It's mm. Five volumes, yeah, and it's un yeah. and it's unfinished. Right. Okay. But I yeah, a, so I read a biography of him, Sart, and it, it's just amazing the amount of writing he did. He was just writing all the time. Oh, so, I know, and then. Yeah, and then the lectures and everything else, yeah. like his political mm. activism, and yeah, so it's not surprising. Well, it is. It's, it's still surprising that he wrote so much, but um, yeah, it's just crazy how much he, how much time he spent writing. Yeah. Um. But oh yeah, but Levinas, mm. right? So mm. you know, with him, he starts with ethics. Mm, and right. Yeah. How does that work? Like. He also like just just a tidbit. He kind of brought phenomenology to France. He was super instrumental in uh, right. translating Husserl. Uh, right. I think it was Logical Investigations. Okay, but, um, I'd mm. have to look that up. But yeah. yeah, so he's early on in the in the the development of all this stuff, existentialism. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah. Uh, tell us about his him and ethics and all that. Yeah, so so his first he wrote a few smaller like essays before um, totality and infinity, but um, and I read those first actually, and yeah, just just kind of general works about um, oops, just kind of general works related to sorry my um, antivirus is updating. <laughs> The oh, no. uh, yeah, <laughs> that's okay. It's, it's it did it already. So okay, you know, your interruptions. Um, yeah. So it's just kind of a foreground, foretaste of what's coming. But he has this idea of totality that really um, kind of drives him, and any a resistance to totalizing, to bringing in something, um, and, and kind of when we have a relation with something, he that he wants, in a way, to do the opposite. He doesn't want to say that it's me and this thing are kind of wrapped up together because then I get, then or then the thing is kind of seen in relation to me. It becomes, it becomes what it is for me through my ideas, through my, through the, the um, vagaries of my own individual individuation. So he, he has this idea that we want to keep things outside this totality. And that's particularly important with other people, the other, who then he says we want to maintain at a distance, at an absolute distance, in fact, uh, and who are, who are always at an absolute distance. And, and we err when we try and bring them into this totality with us so we can kind of see them better, perhaps. And he says, no, we, we never do that. They're always at this infinite distance from us. We never have a grasp of them. They always exceed any way that we might, tr any concepts, any, any way we might try and understand them. They always overflow that, that, uh, that box we try and put them in. And, uh, and that gives, and that yields kind of ethical obligations as a result of that, and, that, and then they become, they, they have, um, they impart responsibilities on me. I, I then have a moral responsibility in the face of this other person who is an absolute, at an absolute distance from me, who's absolutely removed from me. And, uh, and so, yes, he's, he starts off with that idea, 
avoiding a totality. The other is at an infinite distance. They're absolute alterity. That's what he calls them, an absolute other. And then, um, and yet we, we then have this interesting relation um, with them, even though we can't have a like the 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 close, the intimate kind of relation we normally think about when we we think about other people. And it's an ethics though that's not. It doesn't give you rules or guidelines of how to behave. There are no. Um, maxims or anything like that in, in this ethics. So even here, you know, even we get an ethics, but it's not that kind of ethics. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's to your point, it, it's still not ethics. We still don't get an, we, we get an ethical relation in the sense that we have these response, um, Levinas calls it a moral responsibility, but it's uh, it's again not that kind of moral, really not that kind of morality. It's it's more it's more our relation with other people. That's kind of how he defines ethics. I think. Um, I think this brings us kind of like to what I think is a huge debate among the phenomenologists or the existentialists, whatever you want to call these people. The idea of mitzine or mitzine or what this right. German word of yeah. being together. We get one answer in Sartre, we get another in Heidegger, we get another in Levinas, you know, and then it just goes on from there if you get into other people. Uh, I'm sure Kierkegaard had his own thing. But um, wh where do you fall in that? What, who's your, your uh, who do you feel most convinced by on this uh, debate about oh, the mid sign? I mean, this is interesting too because I don't, I, I don't think there is there is there is one answer actually. I don't think there is one answer. It's and I um, I thought about this a lot with Sartre because he has a very conflict based view of relations with others. It's always yeah. you're competing, right, to be the to be the subject. But um, and but that's real. It, it is like he has access. He's tapped into some real. Um, a genuine way that we do have of relating with other people. And there is, a, it, it's not like, maybe it's not the whole truth. It's not the whole of our relations with others, but it's not false, I don't think. And and the same with Levinas, you know, that he's right also. There is this aspect of other people, which is infinitely removed from us, which is at an infinite distance. And when we, we can't, grasp them and they do they do have um they do bring up or raise kind of obligations on us that, that we wouldn't have otherwise and it, and it's not just a matter of of if i can work myself into the subject and reduce them to an object then i've i've kind of won um so both i think that they're equally valid, strangely enough. And so sometimes I find myself thinking that there is no one answer here. It is it is kind of different depending on the way you're looking at it or the aspect of the subject that you're talking about you're trying to grasp. Um, and so, yeah, I don't know. Po is this postmodernist? Maybe there is no one answer. It's Well, yeah. it makes me, I don't know about postmodernist, but it makes me think about you know if you're in a if you're in a cycle a psychotherapy session or something like that it might be useful to have a uh, different ways of understanding how somebody else might be doing being together you know right, right 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 yeah yeah and even if you don't know ultimately if there's if you can't you know describe you know the final way that people are together or whatever you're still able to like you know kind of drill down into that and figure out what's going on a little bit more yep so I, that's hmm. sorry no go on that's it oh and i also think there is um this inherent intrinsic ambiguity to human existence as well and so we like to have kind of fixed things we like to say this is the way it is and it's not that way or this way. It's it's absolute. This is the answer. Um, and I, I think 
you don't get that actually with human beings. And this is one of the things that I like about existentialism and phenomenology. It, it's not, it, there is this nebulosity to it. It's, it doesn't give us kind of fixed answers or, or maybe they do try to, but but when you read Levinas and Sartre and Heidegger, you see that there are these multiple perspectives and they are each valid. They are each legitimate, I think. And I think that reflects this um, underlying ambiguity to human beings. We, we aren't, our experiences are never just, they're, they're never simple enough and clear cut enough to be defined as, as X there's always going to be Y as a possibility or Z as a possibility or, you know, and we kind of operate within this hazy realm. Um, and I like that about it. Like you asked me before, actually, and I didn't answer. <laughs> That's one of the reasons I like, I think, existentialism. It has that. It, it just keeps it open a little bit rather than closing us down as your mind this is the world over here, and this is how you react. This is how you relate. There is, yeah, some interplay. Have you gotten much in uh, Simone de Beauvoir? Um, no, no, I haven't actually. Yeah, okay, because she does. She has her book, The Ethics, the Ethics of Ambiguity. Of, yes, <laughs> which, yes. Which, um, but yeah. Uh, so you're. Do you consider, I don't want to hop onto this yet, but do you consider Deleuze to be within this same kind of group of thinkers or is he someone uh, someone you hold a little bit in a different category? Um, yeah, I think of him more as, strangely enough, maybe this might sound strange, but kind of metaphysical, actually. So when he... Um, Although maybe his later works, he's more gets social and political, but yeah. certainly his early work is, is, and for me, the main book was Difference and Repetition, which I really enjoyed. Uh, if, 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 you, if we can say we enjoy reading these people, I don't know, it's not actually enjoyment, but I enjoyed the, the knowledge I got once I waded yeah. through the text. Um, yeah. It's a crazy thing to do to yourself to try to read any of these <laughs> yeah. people yeah that's right someone said to me once too like, oh but this is this is this is what you you enjoy this right it's not difficult for you i'm like god no i would never call what i'm doing and uh, this is not enjoyment enjoyment's watching netflix or something you know this is i feel like i have to do this it's like a yeah it's a strange perversion <laughs> <laughs> um so you know, I, I noticed this now that I was looking over, you know, what you've been doing videos on. And I noticed you got into like the Kyoto school, some of the Japanese like existentialist stuff. Yeah. I, this is something I didn't investigate a lot uh, before. I know Heidegger had something to do with introducing the Kyoto school to his ideas or I don't know, but. What what I know it's like a pretty significant development over there. Yeah, what, uh, I, I didn't go too far into the Kyoto school. I mean, that's really uh, what's his name? What's the what's the main guy's name there? Uh, the Nishida. guy you Nishida? okay? Yeah, I think he's the he's the linchpin of that. Nishida Kitaro, is that right? There's one guy and he's at the at the center. And pretty much that's, when I looked at it, this is kind of how they define the Kyoto school was their proximity to Nishida. So he was kind of the, the linchpin. And um, it was a loose kind of grouping of people who whose works um, re were related to Nishida. Um, and I, I did read a, a couple of his essays i think but yeah, it was too buddhist for me actually there was too much buddhist um too much of a buddhist leaning for me it would have been perfect for me like 10 years ago maybe but yeah um, at this stage yeah I'm, I'm i'm not i'm not there anymore and yeah uh, and I, know, mm. I know there's a pretty substantial like literature just trying to compare buddhism and phenomenology and existentialism especially because of nothingness and right all that right. yeah yeah 
Yeah, that, I really hate that term, actually. Nothing is. <laughs> uh, why don't we talk about that, I guess, for a second then? Because, like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. you know, this is like the classic response to Sartre is, uh, you know, from like someone who spends all of 10 seconds right. paying attention right. to him is like, well, he just says nothing is a thing. You know, <laughs> right. it's kind of like, what, so... Okay, what is Sartre getting at, and why don't you like this term? And, and oh, so, so yeah, actually, so I do, I do like it in in um, philosophy, if I can. But when it comes to Buddhism, the way they ah. there's a there's a problem. I have a problem with that. And uh, so Sartre is is fine because nothingness is it's not nothing as in like void. This is how I always talk about it. It's not like an absolute emptiness or anything. There, obviously, there's something, but what it's not the nothingness is for its the for itself and the way it's 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 not contributing anything though. That's that's Sartre's point. It's it's kind of offering a perspective instead of like a two like another entity coming and and meeting another entity. So instead of the for itself meeting the world, he says the for itself is nothing in itself. It's just kind of, it's like a like a flashlight torch or something. It's just illuminating the in itself. It's it's making it's giving a field or a a space a clearing. If we're, I'm mixing terms with, across philosophers, but yeah. So the, when he says nothingness, that's all he means by the word nothingness. But then Buddhism, I think, the yeah. Then you start getting metaphysical and. Um, and, we, and as soon as you elevate nothingness to like capital A absolute, capital N nothingness, then I think we get problems. And and it's just the words don't start; they, they start to mean nothing, and they start to kind of to it's a, it's kind of almost a bait and switch. You know, they they bring you in with nothingness as this valid, say, ontological or phenomenological term, and then switch it out for a metaphysical term, and suddenly. You're, you're, um, yeah, you're up the creek, I think. Yeah, <laughs> then. Yeah. Um, so, you know, someone else I see that you like also, I don't know how you want to relate this, but you did the object oriented ontology guy. Oh, yeah, Graham um, Harmon. That's right. And I, have, I haven't heard anybody talk about this in like 12 years or something like that. There's a whole, like, I felt like everything I was reading was talking about it. You know, a decade or so, maybe more mm. at this point. And I haven't heard anybody discuss it at all recently. Mm. Uh, I still think it's really interesting, though. What What is object-oriented ontology, and why is it not this... Why is it different from what people were doing before? Yeah. Oh, I mean, I'm not much of an expert on object-oriented ontology, I have to admit. I have to confess. And I, to be honest, I didn't like it. So that's kind of why I, I did just that one little book, What is Object-Oriented Ontology, and uh, didn't follow through. And the, the series is only like, I think, three or four videos. And, mm. um, and I kind of I work through the book, and it's, it's, um, I'm just kind of neutral while I'm going through it. And then in the last video, I start, I kind of point out why I don't like it. And uh, I feel like I've, like I've, I've lured people in a little bit with it, kind of. There was, there was yeah, so um, I feel a little bit bad about that. But, I, yeah, I, I can't talk too much about it because, to be honest, I can't remember a huge amount about it. You know and, what? It, that's okay. I just remembered why why okay. it was I kept coming across it. And it was because I was learning programming. Oh, uh, yeah, time. yeah, yeah. Right, and there's all this object-oriented programming. Yes, that yes. a bunch of people tried to get creative and compare these things, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. So. Oh, really? Yeah, yes. Uh, yeah, I forgot about that actually. Object-oriented programming. There was, yeah. But the thing with Harmon was he kind of focuses on what an object is, and everything is reduced to an object. So the world is just comprised of objects, but there's like different different levels of objects or so objects kind of can encompass other objects in various ways and um ah yeah i'm not i'm not doing a very i'm not doing it justice actually but 
the long story short, I didn't like it. <laughs> didn't right. it so who? So, uh, what? Who was your favorite so far that you've done in your series? That's a good question. Um, I know it's a hard question because you get different stuff out of all of them. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, I, I feel like Heidegger is. It's hard to go past him, to be honest. It's just he was just so central, even in, in with Sartre and Milo Ponti, they all kind of followed his lead. Um, and he, yeah. So Heidegger would probably be like the way I think is naturally in Heideggerian um, terms. I think the way I think about the world, it's it's just. I've just spent so long with, with him and being in time that my thinking is just kind of aligned with that now. Although I would say as well, Bergson was another um, huge influence on me. And this was after all of the phenomenology and the existentialism kind of, I had him in the background for a while and, and hadn't really read him. And then I, then I jumped in and man, that, that was brilliant that was really good stuff but in a completely different vein so he is as i use the words he's metaphysics so he's yeah. trying to describe say if i if i could call metaphysics the, the fundamental nature of reality and that's what he's looking for so he's kind of parallel to the phenomenology, the ontology. He's not so much interested in the experience, but he's interested in how it is that there, this kind of experiencing thing comes about. What it, What is like the mechanism out of which you get a an experiencing thing called the human being. And um, yeah, he was brilliant. I thought he was actually, a really good reader, a really good writer. Um, so I'm nice not to too familiar with him. Honestly, isn't uh, he deals a lot with uh, atheism and doesn't he? Or am I thinking of somebody else? Am I thinking of Bertrand Russell or something? Oh yes, I, maybe you okay. are. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, no, he's got nothing to say about atheism. Actually, he, he at the end of his life, he he drifts toward Christianity, which annoyed me. No end. Well, so, that's yeah. an interesting thing in all of this, right? You do have a. There's an entire. A uh, Christian existential tradition that, like, even you know, now is still really popular in France, where you have, uh, mm. you know, people who are still writing in that tradition. Mm. I, to me, I'm like, first of all, I, I don't, I'm not familiar enough with Christianity to begin with to even go from there and start trying to tackle like some kind of philosophy within that framework but mm. i still you're totally clear of all that for that mm. reason kierkegaard's even hard for me for that reason mm, but yeah uh, I'm, I'm the same as you i've deliberately avoided all of those guys i did kierkegaard just because strangely enough he was i thought i think he was really insightful like his insights were um kind of wrapped within Christian, a Christian way of thinking and a Christian kind of background. But but the insights that he has can be pulled out of that, I think, can be pulled out of that Christian framework and, and made sense of. And I thought, actually, this might be a great place to make a little mark. I could de-Christianify de um Kierkegaard, but then I realized that's exactly what Heidegger did. <laughs> He's done <laughs> it really. So, um, yeah, there's no point. What did you cover for Kierkegaard? Um, was it fear and trembling or was it uh, sickness unto death? Or? Yeah, it was It was both of those. It was, I did most of his philosophy. This was more philosophical works. So there was fear and trembling, sickness unto death. Um, it, there was, what was it? The concept of anxiety, um, hmm. either or, either, yeah. and uh, concluding unscientific postscript. And that was the best. That's the best one to go to. The, it's the most unwieldy of titles, but that was the one that, um, that I, I, I got the most out of. And I think he, he kind of shows his colors a little bit 
more in that one rather than writing under the pseudonyms all the time. Although he's still writing under a pseudonym, but but I feel like we get more more to the to the heart of um, Kierkegaard in there. And he criticizes or comments on some of his earlier works and says you know, what he thinks of those. Still under a pseudonym, but but yeah, when I read it, I, I felt like I was getting kind of what Kierkegaard's position is quite clearly. And I, I didn't, I, sorry, I didn't go through those books page by page, chapter by chapter, like I normally do. I tried to kind of synthesize everything together. Oh, okay. All right. In a way that Kierkegaard would have hated for sure. <laughs> well, what's interesting about, I think about him as like a figure, or actually maybe it's not about him, but he gets left out of the category of young Hegelians or like the, uh, you know, you get you get like your Feuerbach, your Marx, your, you know, sometimes people will in, include Bakunin, but nobody mentions Kierkegaard in that category. And it's funny because he was so much involved with or being a response to Hegel. Right. Yes. And uh, and yet it's like, yeah, I think he was literally in the same lectures as like Marx and some of the some of these other people like listening to Hegel do yeah. his whatever his philosophy of right or whatever it was. But yeah, mm-hmm. he gets left out of that and and I don't I think until there's gonna be a reckoning where like you get all the young Hegelians in one room and start <laughs> not you, but yeah, yeah. like <laughs> that's gonna have to happen. Cause right. it's just like you get this weird split. What, what have you gotten into Hegel much? Or no, that's one guy who's kind of there's a gaping hole in my philosophy knowledge, and it's him. That's uh, me it, too. Yeah, it's 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 a gap I do want to fill, but the problem is there's just so many other people I really want to read first, <laughs> and um, and I don't think I'm gonna love Hegel. That's the other problem. Like, um, yeah, and I, I've read bits and pieces about him and I think like it's not going to be a, a project that I'm really passionate about so it is difficult to put aside these other people who I am really kind of getting into um yeah just just to fill in a gap yeah exactly and it's not like you know you're you're getting into like some older language with him and it's anytime I see someone talk about Hegel I get a little annoyed with with the things they're referencing like you know the owl of minerva right right i'm just like can you talk like a human being that lives in the 21st century or do you gotta Mm -hmm. like yeah (laughs) but um yeah i've i've tried and not gotten far with him and right i've heard that he's really difficult really dense and hard to read as well yeah well it explains why it's uh (laughs) The people responding to him are equally as <laughs> dense and hard to read. Um, Maybe a different way from the people like from like Heidegger and Co. You know, like they're difficult to read as well. But but it's worth making the effort too. Like I feel like there is, it's it's a yeah, it's it's difficult, but it's um there's there's definitely a value that comes from engaging with them seriously. Um. Yeah. I. I. How do you, what are some of those uh, values that you take away from it? I, I find it hard to explain exactly what it is I'm getting out of reading oh, these right. people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the way I always describe this is like, um, what am I taking away actually? It's just a, a way of thinking. It's, it's a way of understanding, I think. Um what it is to be a human, actually. That's what that's what, what really drew me first to existentialism and phenomenology is that I feel like now I understand the tools that I'm using in my, you know, everyday life when I look at things, when I remember, when I... And it, it doesn't really have a practical value, but at the same time it is practical because it's it's the most practical thing there is because it's about our experience it's about the way we interact every second of every day 
So I feel like, yeah, it's, it's really giving me um, a, a better grasp of who I am and, and what I'm doing fundamentally, not not at the level of like Heidegger and ontic level. Like it's not going to affect what I what I do or or um, it's going not going to change any of my decisions. But I understand the process that makes those decisions, that brings about the fact that I can have a decision. And I feel like that just gives me a little bit of ground. It just grounds me a little bit. Um, again, in a way that that you wouldn't notice, you wouldn't know, you wouldn't, um, and it doesn't affect kind of me at at that worldly level. But uh, yeah, it just gives me a, a center, I think. And the same with the metaphysics as well. The metaphysics is very abstract, and 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 that's how we usually think of metaphysics. But this is I um my my touchstone for this is Bergson. And same thing, like I just feel like I understand uh, things make a little bit more sense to me. Um, not kind of in a um, from a scientific lens, but but just from how I fit into reality. And mm. uh, again, I just feel a little bit grounded, a little bit more centered, maybe. And yeah, that's that's the benefit for me. I think. I think it's hard to sell people on on some of this stuff because a lot of, it seems like what a lot of people are looking for when they do, uh, I guess maybe it has something to do with the subculture, whatever that I tend to be part of, which is like leftist political like stuff. And what people seem to want is, you know, whether they admit it or not, they do want programmatic kind of like ethics in the way you said Levinas is Mm. not doing ethics. Mm. Or, you know, identity stuff is such a big debate, you know, at least in America. I don't know how, how it is everywhere. Right. But I, this is, mm. to me, this has always been like a solid answer to questions about identity. Yeah. And the human experience in general, right? If you're going to, you know, and if you're going to like, do political ideology or political philosophy, whatever you want to call it, your theory of human nature, your theory of uh, what being human is all about is going to be at the center of how you think about what politically is correct. Right. Yep. Like if, you know, just like to give like some, basic example like if you don't feel if you don't think like women or something can feel pain or just some crazy (laughs) like thing like you're going to definitely have a a political outcome from that that's right you know not going to be very beneficial for women or you know (laughs) but at a the stuff that's going on with these philosophers at a deeper level i do think has knock-on effects later when it comes to you know if human beings in general have the kind of freedom sartre talks about or perception, you know, is as meaningful as the way Merleau-Ponty talks about it, yeah. Uh, or, or meaning laden, I guess, mm-hmm. or like mm-hmm. things like that. You, you, you know, you're you have a different outlook than someone who's like, you know, has a very mechanistic view of perception, or someone who has like yeah. A, yeah. a deterministic view of human decision making and things like that. Yeah, uh, which. You know, so what I see happening in like my people who I know who are anarchists who will get into philosophy, they'll go for something like Deleuze. And I think, you know, so I want to talk about him a little bit and like put him into this, into like relation to these other people, because I think you, you do get like a little bit more of that concrete practical usefulness when you do read Deleuze, especially because, you know, he's working on books literally called Capitalism and Schizophrenia or things right. like topics that people want to yeah. like make use of. But yeah. yeah. Tell me what, what you've been doing with him. Yeah. So for me, difference in repetition was the, the, that was the linchpin for me. And I did read anti-Oedipus. Um, and to be honest, I hated it. 
and I yeah. didn't really get anything from it the first time through. And to, towards the end, I was just like, I was my eyes were the words were going into my into one eye and out the other. You know, there was just like I was just reading to finish at the end. Um, but then there were moments of clarity too. I thought, and it, this was kind of strange about my experience with anti Oedipus. There was uh, like I'd read this like pages and pages of of I don't know, like it just just kind of fluff and then suddenly there'd be two pages of of a real good delusian description of of how something arises kind of at at a at a deeper like metaphysical level and i was like that's that's the gold right there that's more of the difference in repetition stuff so i don't know maybe there was this is the he was writing it with um he was co-writing it right with the other guy what's his name guitari Guitari, yeah. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I found that not so useful, but I loved the difference in repetition. And unfortunately, yeah, it's it's kind of the exact opposite of, of what you're talking about. I, I didn't get into the politics, into the kind of social activism side of, of him. And um, although what I did kind of think on my first reading of anti Oedipus, and again, I've only read it once, I haven't gone through it again in any depth, but it did seem to me like he's kind of trying to um, draw his uh, his recommendations, say, for how we should live or how we should structure society out of his metaphysics. And his metaphysics is difference essentially it's about that chaotic interplay of different you know of forces that that aren't anything that aren't aren't anything determinate from the beginning and it's only out of this interplay that you get determinate anything um and that so it's a very chaotic kind of metaphysical picture and i feel like he's kind of he was trying to import that into the way that we should act and we should behave. And so capitalism then does the kind of the opposite. It tries to mold us. It forces us to, to act in certain ways and, and, or not even capitalism, but society in general tries to restrict our flows or whatever it is that he talks about. And, um, and I found that a little bit, um, I don't know, it didn't work for me so much. What, What did you think of that? I have only tried to really get into a thousand plateaus and that's the one, you know, it's the way it's, first of all, the way the book is structured, it's these like vignettes or what, you know, they're, they're like plateaus, you know, Mm. he, him. And I think he also did that one with Felix Vitari as well. Yeah, that's right. So the way I didn't, I don't like for as much as, uh, you know, I'm really interested in like, the absurd or like whatever, all these things. I actually like a straightforward kind of book. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Me too. (laughs) And just like kind of having like a collage of, you know, interesting sort of takes on, you know, I don't know, sadomasochism or Mm. like some, what, like a, a bunch of different things that it's, you know, you creatively weave them together in your mind, Mm. but, Mm. There, there's not necessarily a rational order to the book. Right. And he recommends it, you know, don't even bother reading it that way if you don't want to, you know, just go <laughs> yeah. to. It's really just not my thing. It's a little too poetic for me, I think. Yeah. And yeah, I'm so I've kind of stayed away from him. A lot of his work gets incorporated into other things I read, like his idea of desiring machines or like, uh, the war machine or whatever and body without organs and mm. some of these mm. concepts that come out of them. I, you know, I'm familiar with them because uh, of other things that people are writing, but mm. yeah, that's, yeah, you know, I've, I was thinking of maybe reading a thousand plateaus there because the same as you, like I've heard some interesting snippets uh, or not the same as you. I, I've heard some interesting snippets about it and some interesting concepts, which I really like. But yeah, I, I have this sneaking suspicion that once I start reading it, I'm I'm not they're, they're there, but you have to kind of 
they're plucked out of the middle of kind of a, a morass of other stuff that's yeah semi poet semi semi poetic and and that that was a, a, I noticed that in difference in repetition even as early as that he's he is very he's obviously really intelligent and he's you know he's drawing on all these different different areas of research and he's talking about you know incorporating the Greeks and he talks about the Greek gods in that as well he uses those and um but yeah it's uh yeah I'm like you I just just Give it, give it to me straight. Just give, tell me what you, tell me what you want me to know. Yeah, and you'll you'll grind through it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that's right. But at least it's straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I think kind of one of the, the funny things about your channel, it's called Absurd Being, and I don't see Camus on there. Right? Have you not? Right. So. Yeah. Are you just saving him for the last thing you ever do? Or what's going on? Yeah, that's funny. I don't know why I omitted him. I think, oh, I do know why, actually. I just found he wasn't, there wasn't enough in him to warrant a, a series like this. So the, 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 the books that I choose, and again, this is the question I, I didn't answer properly when you asked it first time but the books i choose are usually books that are difficult really hard to get through and that that kind of need an explanation um mm. and that often there isn't one and so i see that as being like the raison d'etre for the for the the channel a little bit like I, i'm i'm trying to explain these books that need explanations and camus is pretty straightforward actually yeah um, and and it really yeah it boils down to that idea of the absurd um kind of that's at the heart of Camus but it's yeah well it's just not that difficult and there's not a huge amount to go through and I didn't need any further work to understand it either that's another thing like I said it's kind of a selfish <laughs> it's my it's my own project just kind of broadcast to whoever wants to see it rather than catering to an audience and um and yeah, so that's that's the only reason I haven't tackled Camus at all. No, that makes a lot of sense. I think like the densest thing would probably be the rebel. And it's not hard to process at all. It's, yeah, somehow people manage to screw it up. But <laughs> <laughs> it's all, it's not a, you know, it's not like trying to figure out what difference is or right, right. like that. Yeah. 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 Uh so I I don't know what do you have any anything you've been thinking about lately you want to talk about? I mean we kind of oh, we did a warp uh, a warp tour of your your uh playlists I think. So right. Nietzsche. I kind of left him out on purpose. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there was another one too. I wasn't I didn't know really know how to tackle him because he also writes in a kind of not a very easy, easy to summarize style. A lot, a lot of aphoristic kind of works, and um, so yeah, I opted for "Thus Spoke Zarathustra" just because I think that gives the best picture of his overall take on on things. And um, and I just kind of picked out quotes that I think give a good flavor for what Nietzsche's about. Um, and uh, also what I'm doing at the moment, uh, there's The Invisible and The Invisible. That's the main series I'm working on, which I'm really enjoying. And I'm really glad I waited to come back to it because I'm getting a lot more out of it now than I would have if I'd made the video series when I read it. Um, and part of the reason, actually, is I've been reading Derrida, of all people, if you, um, which I, I would have been shocked if I had told myself gone back a year ago and said you'll be reading Derrida a year later I wouldn't have believed it but um and I and I'm enjoying it that's the crazy thing I'm Interesting. enjoying his interest his early work so um that's kind of the the big thing that I'm working on at the moment aside from the visible and the invisible is Derrida and I'm just just reading his I read, I've read out of grammatology and there's a book of lectures, or no, a book of essays, short essays he wrote, he compiled 
called Writing Indifference. And they both came out, both of the books come out, came out in 1967. And, um, and they just give a really a nice kind of picture of what Derrida, of what uh, his, his whole kind of way of approaching philosophy is. And I, strangely enough, I'm going to do a video series on him too. I want to compile this into a, into a few videos. Not, I'm not going to go step by step through of grammatology or anything that I don't think that's that beneficial but I just just want to summarize him and get some um, some of his kind of key ideas out in the way that uh, yeah he and it's very very similar to Deleuze actually I'm finding this idea that there is no he's a very anti-structuralist the this idea mm -hmm. that there is no center there's no fixed center and and you know the center is kind of what we're we're choosing it and then building the edifice around it, um, and what's actually at the the core of it is this: it's more fluid, it's more dynamic. It's it, there is no capital T truth. That really kind of blend, um, fits in well with with a lot of what difference and repetition was about. And uh, yeah, that that strangely enough has has been occupying me for the last so, six months. So. Um. I always feel like I got to defend studying phenomenology from post-structuralist okay. uh, thinkers. And, you know, what you just said, you're getting into Derrida. You know, we just talked about Deleuze. What And historically, post-structuralism, at least for a good while, took the place of existentialism in France. And I don't know about Germany, but it, uh, you know, a lot, I feel like a lot of people like took post-structuralism, ran with it and forgot to bother studying phenomenology because of it or something like that. Right. Well, how do you, how do you feel about that? Or do you agree with that assessment? Does it, do the things seem almost indistinguishable or do they blend together for you or? Um, I, so I actually have a very, um, what am I? I'm very open to all of these different ideas and, and a little bit inclusive maybe. So I tend to see, uh, I talked about it earlier, the different ideas, competing ideas on the surface of it, but actually I think they're just describing different aspects of something. And I think phenomenology is always going to be relevant for me because, it's irrespective of, of how successful science is, for example, in the scientific method or where um, social philosophy or political philosophy ends up going, phenomenology is always going to be important because it's not trying to give us truths about the world. It's not trying to say that this is how society is or this is how it should be or this is, this is what experience is and this is, therefore, this should be the case. It's just describing your conscious experience, the structures that, that make your experience what it is. And that's always relevant and it's always legitimate, irrespective of what you believe about any other branch of, of philosophy or, or anything else, psychology, th those phen phenomenological um, small t truths are always going to be true. Well, they're not, but they're not kind of trying to to give a blanket truth. This is the way it is, and everything else is wrong. So I, I actually divide up phenomenology, ontology, and metaphysics into mm -hmm. three distinct categories uh, that each uh, that are each valid and legitimate within their own domain. And the problems only come when you try and cross those domains and say, from a metaphysical perspective criticize phenomenology because phenomenology is not metaphysics it's something completely right. different it's legitimate it's, it's it's as real as anything else but only in phenomenology and if i can just mention it i, I just finished a book actually which is um articulating this three threefold structure it's phenomenology ontology and metaphysics in the way that they are all um valid and legitimate but they give us a different kind of, they, they each have different answers to these questions, uh, but they're all valid and they all kind of 
fit together in this in this edifice that is reality. Um, and so we, 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 we make a mistake when we try and criticize one from the position of another. And so I, I feel like that's the case. I felt that with Deleuze, he criticizes phenomenology and his soul and difference in repetition. And I mentioned it in the video series. He, um, it, it's, his soul wasn't, uh, yeah, his soul wasn't doing metaphysics to criticize him for whatever it was, um, is missing the point. Um, or maybe he does actually drift into med- No, he doesn't. No, so, sorry, edit that out for me. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But, um, yeah, so the, these different branches. And uh, Derrida then as well is very um, interesting because he is – He's not really metaphysical. He's not really phenomenological or ontological. It's, he kind of fits in this. Yeah, I haven't quite figured out how to to situate him, but his any criticisms he have he has of phenomenology are. Um, I don't think they they get to the heart. That I don't think they they give us reason to to disbelieve phenomenology anymore. It's it's a different different endeavors. They're doing different things. That's something I think happens a lot, actually, where you get someone like Foucault or Derrida, they'll they'll do a critique of phenomenology or whatever. You know, this could be anything, but I'm just these are mm. the uh the case I'm just using as an example. And that doesn't I think people take that and they think you're supposed to then not study those things or right. like yeah, that is the, the criticism is not a dismissal, a right. dismissal. Right. Yeah. And you could cr- criticize like even fairly deeply who Searle, Heidegger, Sartre, whatever, and still maintain that, no, they're totally necessary to understand and read. And even like might be a backdrop for your own philosophy, you know, right. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of, yeah, the epistemology is kind of the other big one with the when you get into the post structuralists, you know, they you'll get some arguments where it's like, well, can you really have like this sort of like take on meaning from like mm. a phenomenology angle if meaning is ultimately like embedded in language or something and mm. language is kind of mm. like this. Yeah. Yeah, language is the thing that structures us, <laughs> you know that kind of that kind of deal. But uh, yeah, let's. I think we've really covered a good amount of uh, what you're doing with your channel and you know where you want it to go. Is there anything you want to wrap this up on, and we could uh, uh, finish up the recording? Um, no, I guess I guess I did a wrap up before when I talked about what I'm going to do in the future. The uh, yeah, I, guess, I know. <laughs> I did I did it too early. The um, Derrida is probably the next thing, and then at some point I do want to do a guy called Gilbert Simonden, who is not very famous, but he had a um, around the same time as. Deleuze and Derrida as well, and he kind of builds on Merleau-Ponty a little bit with the idea of how, so his thing is individuation, how an individual is kind of arises out of kind of the, the prior state. And, uh, and it's, again, it, it, these ideas must have been floating around at the time because they're all connected, Deleuze, Derrida, Simon then this idea of yeah coming an individual arising out of a more chaotic background or, or context. And he go drills into that a little bit in, in, in some detail, which is which is quite interesting in a different way from the way Deleuze did in difference and repetition, but a way that I think complements it quite nicely. So that's and that's kind of what I'm working towards in terms of the videos as well. Well, that sounds pretty interesting. I would, I would think Freud, Freud might be kind of one of the connectors in in what you just mentioned because of that. But that sounds really interesting. I look forward to that. 
Mm, yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, the only reason I've kind of Freud's come up on my radars through Derrida and Deleuze who talk about him quite a lot. And so, yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I kind of dismissed them early on a, along with all of psychology and psychoanalysis. Um, but maybe that was uh, thinking it was a little bit hasty. I don't know. What, what are your thoughts about um, Freud as a, someone who studied him, I guess? Yeah. I, I never uh, got super into him, but I think act. So there's a term called meta psychology, which is basically like your, your overall, your overarching theory the theoretical categories that you use for doing a, a psychological analysis. And so Freud had, you know, he was uh, really important in the history of psychology because he kind of broke with the meta psychological thing um, approach that came before him, which was very behaviorist. It was, it was based on like, empirically observing uh you know when you prod a mouse or whatever what it does recording you know the results it was that kind of science mm -hmm. and you know what freud ultimately wanted to do was have that kind of rigor that you have in a, an objective science but somehow do it to under to study what's going on inside of someone's experience really Mm. And then you have the shit about the subconscious. Mm -hmm. But he offered two or three different meta psychologies. One of them was the id, the ego, and the superego structure, you know, someone's personality in this way. Then he had another meta psychology, which is his drive theories, mm -hmm. where you have, uh, you know, the eros, which is you know, sex or love or whatever. But then you have the death drive, Thanatos. That's another meta psychology. And I've just, neither of those I have found very appealing. But mm. what they, they did do is they opened up the door for, I think people like Sartre, you know, to come along and say, you know, uh, how about the in itself and the for itself and being for others and mm. like a meta psychology right. rooted in those uh, concepts. Yep. And that's sort of, you know, that's where Freud is for me. Mm -hmm. um, one of the tests, I guess, the way that I kind of test out the way I'm thinking about a different philosophy is like, what is it? What kind of personality theory do you get out of it? Like, do you do you wind up with something like the Myers Briggs personality stuff, or like do you wind up with something more ambiguous and you know like that's kind of you know I'm I'm always thinking about that so right yeah mm -hmm. I don't know it's that's a big question to, <laughs> a big question to answer but yeah introduced right at the end nice that's all right. <laughs> You can um, cut that if you want, I guess. No, cut. no, like you. I mean, I, I'm doing this all for myself, too. I mean, I don't really, right. I don't have an audience I'm appealing to or anything. So, yeah. totally fine. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I really appreciate that you came on and everything. I know you don't do a lot of these. So, well, I really appreciate the offer. It's been great to sit down and chat with you. And uh, I don't do many because I don't get many offers. So it was, uh, yeah, I was really happy to 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 come along and, and sit down. Hopefully, something something I said made some sense to someone somewhere, and that will, um, yeah. Well, one reason you might not get a lot of people asking you to do interviews, it's a little hard to contact you. <laughs> um, so uh, I wasn't, I couldn't figure out what. To email you or how I was supposed to get in uh, touch with you. So how do you like prefer people to reach out to you if they want to get a hold of you? Yeah, just usually email, I think. Yeah, I think email. I do have Twitter, but that's not there. <laughs> I'm not very active. 
not very active at all on social media, to be honest. And I just, I just haven't found it very useful for what I want to do, you know? Like, what can I, what can I say in like 80 characters or less or whatever it is they give you that's um, philosophically interesting? I just, I just feel like I'm kind of shouting into the void and, and in 80 characters or less, I'm not saying much of, of interest anyway. So that's one of the reasons I went for these long form videos too. I, I want to really get into something. I don't want to just do a superficial cover. And I don't know, yeah, social media just seems, doesn't scratch that itch for me. So, all right. So we're not yeah. finding you on TikTok. <laughs> no, like... Yeah. No, no, no videos of dancing cats or anything either. So, <laughs> All right. Well, I'll get your email into the show description, you know, and uh, yeah, I think this went really well. I'm going to end the recording now. And uh, once again, thanks for coming on. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was great.